Uh, for those of you who don't know me, hi, my name is Kaylee Hawk. I work as the director of marketing for XY Planning Network, and I'm also a writer and a content marketer. Um, but this really, this session is about you guys and what you're trying to get out of it. So I would love to know, like you know why I'm here, I'm here to talk about this stuff, but why are you guys here? Does anybody like want to shout out and volunteer? Like what are you hoping to get out of this session? Yes? I want to write more persuasively. Awesome, you are in the right place. <laughs> anybody else? Yes? I want to encourage people to take action on these ideas I have. Ooh, I love that. You are also in the right place. That's definitely what I want to give you today is something that you can take home and actually use like right away, no matter what your situation is, to make your writing more persuasive, more compelling, so people are left in a place where they're like, I'm ready to move. That's awesome. Yes? They're reading every email, they're opening every one, they're go getting down to the bottom of the page, and then they're not just, they're just not hitting that buy now button. It's just some, there's some sort of gap there. Yeah, okay, the awesome. Yes? I'm actually interested in finding ways to use my writing to bring out emotions in people. Ooh. Because I'm very, like, I'm more of a technical uh, Right, technical yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I think we'll cover that too today. So hopefully we'll get everybody's needs met here. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we are talking about writing persuasively. So in terms of marketing though, like what does that have to do with anything? For me, I'm first and foremost, I'm a writer. And I really believe with the rise of like content marketing and inbound marketing, that's a totally different way of doing things. The old school way, I probably would not have been a very good marketer because I like to tell stories. I like to attract people to me and you know, give them something of value. The old way of marketing is like interruption marketing, right? You're gonna buy an email list and spam them, or you're gonna buy advertising and kind of interrupt what they're doing to get their attention. Inbound marketing is all about creating something where your ideal audience comes to you. They naturally wanna hear what you have to say. So I believe successful marketing lies in your copy and knowing how to make that copy really, really good to where it's compelling, it's interesting, and again, I'm a writer, so it's all about, to me, stories. And I want to kind of teach you about that today. It doesn't have to be dry and boring and just like, hey, here's what I have to offer. Are you interested? Like, that's not going to really persuade anybody to your way of thinking. So again, it's about com crafting compelling stories, and it's putting readers in action. That's how you know your marketing is being successful, and your copy can help you do that. You also want to try to entertain, educate, or inspire people while you're at it. And I know this is a lot to be you know, doing, but that's what I hope we can leave you with today is a really simple framework for doing that. So before I go any farther, you know, I want to talk about how that connects with marketing. You know, I can say it does, but it, it's hard to kind of imagine it if you don't have a system in place. So this is like a typical marketing funnel, right? At the very top level, we have awareness. People are figuring out you know, what their issues are, and then they're gonna evaluate their potential solutions, and then they'll hopefully convert, they'll make a purchase. So your copy can help people get through that funnel. In the awareness stage, like I said, somebody is starting to become aware that, hey, I've got a problem, or they've got a pain point that they kinda want resolved, or they could have an opportunity in their lives that they wanna capitalize on. But in this top of the funnel stage, they're just now becoming aware of it. Um, they don't really know what to do about it. They're learning, they're gathering information, and your copy can help educate them. And then that second part, the middle of the funnel, that's the evalu uh, uh, yeah, evaluation stage, uh, where they're aware now, and now they're looking for solutions, like what can solve my problem, what can alleviate this pain point for me, or what can help me really take advantage of this opportunity that I've now found in my life. And in the conversion phase, they're ready to make a decision, they're ready to make a purchase, and your copy can help pull them through the bottom of the, that funnel and really get them on your side to purchase your service if you write compellingly enough. So when I say content, I'm gonna say content, copy, writing, da 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 And if anybody here, is anybody here like not consider themselves a writer? They're like, no, I don't like that, not at all. Got it, I hear you. So don't worry, you are still in the right place. Um, because content does refer to things like blogs, email, social media, when you sit and you sit and you write. And it's just a lot of work and it's hard and it's effort. Um, we are talking about some of that. But we're also talking about videos, podcasts, courses that you cre create, infographics, 
all of that stuff requires copy too, so it also applies. For me, for example, videos and podcasts, like as a writer, I live in my own head and I don't really speak that well as you may have started to pick up on. Um, so copy helps me with these things because I can sit and I can write out a video script or I can write an outline for a podcast. So all content that you create is gonna require a copy somewhere. Maybe it's just your notes to get yourself organized or maybe it's a full blown ebook or an article or something like that. So if you're worried about like, oh, I'm not a writer, I'm not really looking to do that, this is still relevant to you and you can still take all of this and apply it to so many different places in what you're doing because it's really about communication. That's what we're really talking about. We can say writing, we can say copy, but this is just a way to communicate with people and we need to know how to do this, especially in a digital age. It's become more and more important that we can speak well and write well and convey our ideas in different formats. So again, I want to leave you something with really something that's really, really actionable, that's something that you can take, and I don't care who you are or what you're doing. I'm assuming if you're here on the advisor track, you're in financial planning or financial advising somehow. Um, so we all have a common ground there. Um, but I, you know, you are all doing something different. You're all serving different people, and you're all talking about different things. I'm hoping that these frameworks you can take and apply and just use no matter what. That's my goal today. So before we get into those, this is the golden rule that we are going to use for all of these. You need to start with your audience. You can't follow any of these frameworks and none of your copy can be compelling, no matter how great of a writer you are, if you don't know your audience. You need to deliver the right message to the right person and also at the right time. Knowing your audience is going to help you do that. You can have the greatest messaging, you can send it at exactly the time they need to hear it, but if you're not talking to the right person, that's going to totally, like, ships passing in the night sort of a thing. You're not going to get there. You can also have the right person, but your messaging is a little off. You're not really communicating what they need to hear when they need to hear it. So if you want, I'll give you some information at the end where you can get in contact with me. I'll send you a little freebie, a little worksheet um, to help you kind of figure out who your audience is if you're not sure. Um, if you're kind of familiar with content marketing, um, buyer personas or customer avatars, something like that may ring a bell. That's what we're really talking about here. We want to build those out. So we want to get in the mindset, get in the heads of the people that you're trying to serve and eventually trying to persuade to purchase from you. So that's going to be, this isn't on every slide, but just pretend that it is because it is step one to all of these frameworks is knowing your audience. Who are you speaking to and what are their needs? How do they live their lives? What's their mindset? So this is the first framework. Very, very simple, problem and solution. You're gonna state your audience's problem and you're gonna offer your solution. And that sounds really easy, sounds very simple, and it is. It's helpful if we have like an example of how this actually works. Now the red and green, that's not good or bad, it's just to kind of point out the different components of this problem and framework solution. So this says, do you feel sure about the choices you make with your money? If you can't answer this question with a resounding yes, don't worry, together we can change that. I'll help you develop the confidence you need to manage your money so you can achieve your goals. So the red here, that's the problem. This person is not sure what they're doing. They don't have any confidence. Maybe they're insecure about the choices they're making with their money. That's a problem because now you're stuck. You're not taking action. The solution for this advisor is, hey, I'm going to help you develop that confidence that you need to make good decisions. So we're going to solve that problem for you, and I'm, I'm going to do it because I'm going to give you the confidence, and you're going to take off and do what you need to do. So does anybody have questions about this one? Again, it's pretty simple, but I, don't, I want to make sure that we continue on together. So <laughs> any questions? Any comments? Yes? Are you recommending starting every book or writing an example like this or just thinking about it this way? I think it's helpful to start by thinking about it that way because that kind of gets you in the right <laughs> mindset. You don't necessarily have to start off like, bam, here I am, you can have an introduction. But this is really gonna be like the heart of whatever you're doing, whether it's an email, whether it's, you know, you can even condense it down into a tweet size snippet um, or a full blown blog post. That's kind of the point that you're making. And again, this is just a short, this is a short example to show you. You could really develop this out and really go into detail about what is that problem that you're having, and then, hey, here's a solution that I have for you. Does that make sense? So our next framework, same kind of thing. It's the problem and solution to the second power. And what we're going to do here is a little mean. We're going to state the reader's problem again, and then we're going to really drive it, drive that point home. Just take that knife and dig it in a little bit. 
Um, and that's not nice. But what we're going to do is provide the relief, which is, again, your solution. And I think this one is a little bit more effective once you start getting comfortable with the idea of, all right, I'm going to talk about a problem, and then I'm going to present the solution. This really just kind of gets somebody really agitated. Um, and like I said, really rub it in. You want to make the point that you have a problem, you have a pain point. And to get, this gets somebody to the point, it's like, I have to do something about it. So as another example, this is very similar to the first one. It's a little bit different. So this one says, do you feel sure about the choices you make with your money? Not knowing what to do can mean missing out on opportunities to build wealth and live the life you really want. If you can't answer this question with a resounding yes, don't worry. Together we can change that. I'll help you develop the confidence you need to manage your money so you can achieve your goals. So in this one, that top, it, we still have the same problem, but then we're going to kind of you know, again, stick that knife in and twist it a little bit because what you have is an agitation point where you're explaining, this is what you're missing out on if you have this problem. It's not, okay, yeah, you got the problem, but now you're missing out on opportunities to build wealth. Like That's not happening for you because you're not confident enough in the decisions that you make. You're also not living the life you really want. And who wants to miss out on that? That really drives somebody to be like, okay, I have to do something about this. I have to find a solution. And again, we can introduce that solution, give them that idea in the second part of that. You always want to provide the relief once you kind of start jabbing at somebody. You don't want to you know, keep on and on because that's just agitating. You want to provide the solution in there somewhere. So how about this one? Does anybody have any questions, comments, ideas on, on this framework? Yes. No, no, no. This is just to show you, like, here are the different pieces of it. Um, so it's very obvious. Um, you could try to play with formatting if you wanted. You could, like, bold something um, that you really want to stand out in a blog post or something like that, because people do skim. They don't read the whole thing. So you can draw attention to different things. I don't know if I would use red light colors, but <laughs> there are definitely certain ways that you can do it. Um, so play around and experiment with that and see how you can highlight different things. Um, you can use like call out boxes, you can use block quotes, things like that. All right, so our third framework, this is the before and after states. And this is a great one to use if you really do want to tell, tell a story. And for longer form content, this works really well because you can really go into a lot of detail. So the first part of this is the before state. You want to describe where is your audience now? What is their life like right now? What is that like for them when they have a problem that's not solved or a pain point that really hurts them and drags them down? Or again, if they have an opportunity but they're not making the most of it and they're missing out. What is life like for them? And this is again where knowing your audience comes in really handy because if you do, you know what they're thinking. You can get into their mindset and you know exactly what life is like for them when you write. So that after state, now you want to paint a picture of what could life be after that, you know, you come in and provide your solution after they have your service or your product. What is life like then? What could things be like for them? And again, really get vivid. Paint a, uh, a paint picture, tell a story, um, use many metaphors, uh, <laughs> and kind of give them a place where they can kind of step over and say, like, wow, this is where I'm at, and this is where I could be. Your copy can do that and kind of bring them along. And that leaves somebody in a place of, like, OK, now I know what's possible for me. And that's kind of what you want to do with your after state. What is possible for this person once you work with them or once you deliver your service? So again, an example of this one. And again, I've, from XY Plan Network, this is copy that I've actually used. It's condensed. Um, but it says, it's scary to leave an existing firm to start your own RIA. As a young independent advisor, you can suffer from a lack of community and support from within the industry that you need to reach success. But when you join XY Planning Network, you instantly receive over 300 fellow advisors eager to cheer you on. They know exactly what you deal with and how to help you through your biggest business challenges. So that red is kind of the before state. For young advisors, maybe you have a job and your, your employer really values you because young talent is, is scarce in this industry. So it's scary to leave a sure thing where it's like, yes, you have a job for as long as you want it because you're a rare commodity. It's scary to go out on your own and take on all that risk and all that responsibility when you have a pretty sweet deal going on over here. It's also scary because there's no community or support in our industry for a lot of young advisors. People will tell you over and over again, you can't go out on your own and serve young clients as a young advisor. You can't run a profitable business that way. It's just not going to happen. It's not how things have always been done. There's a lot of naysayers out there. So there's not really industry support to help you like, yeah, you know what, you can do it. You can do this. Let's help you. 
I want, you know, what do you need from us? There's no education. Um, so that's a pretty scary place to be in, and that's, that's the before. But the after is that you instantly receive 300 best friends who are here to help you. You know, that's the kind of the picture we want to paint is that there's a community. This is how life could be for you. There is a place that you can go where people support you, where people want to see you succeed, and they can tell you what works and what doesn't because they've been there. So before and after, does anybody have questions about that? Comments, ideas? Good, that was pretty clear. Awesome. So the fourth framework, this is the FAB framework, um, and that stands for features, advantages, and benefits. And with this one, if, you, if you're not sure the difference between like a feature and a benefit, the example I like to use is to think of a minivan. A minivan has 17 million cup holders in it. That's a feature, is the 17 million cup holders. The benefit is that you can put your 17 million kids in the minivan and they all have their own little cup holder, put their stuff in. The van hopefully doesn't get as dirty because there's a place for everything. It's not as much chaos. Um, that not as much chaos, all the things you can do with the cup holders, that's the benefit. Um, and the advantage part of this is to kind of hold somebody's hand through the explanation of your features. So what you want to do is like, here are the features, here's this bullet point list of items that you get when you work with me. And now that's, here's how this helps you. The advantage is how does this work for you? How does this, uh, you know, help you through your, to get to your goals, to get all, all the things that you want done with your money. And then you're going to come in with the benefits and say like, this is what this really means for you. This is how this impacts your life in a really big way. Um, it's kind of the underlying intangible thing. Maybe it's a feeling, maybe it's a sense of freedom. That's a benefit of working with a financial advisor. So as an example of this one, so when you work with XY, or XYZ Wealth Management, you get a comprehensive financial plan. This is your roadmap that shows you how to get from where you are to where you want to be with your financial goals. We'll work together to keep you accountable so you can use your money to create the life you want to live. And again, the colors kind of designate the different parts of this. The feature is the comprehensive financial plan. I write this up, I'm going to deliver it to you, whether it's on paper, email, anything like that. That's a feature of the service that you're providing. Maybe the advantage of that is, okay, the, the plan shows you where you are and where you want to go. That's very helpful to your client. But the real benefit is that that plan and that roadmap holds the client accountable and it's going to get them all the way through the process. You're not going to let them fall off. You're going to keep them accountable to the actions they need to take um, to create the life that they want to live. So again, as you can kind of see with a lot of these, it's a lot of hand-holding. It's a lot of bringing someone along on like this journey that you're taking them. And remember, these are condensed for the sake of this presentation, but you can really blow these out. And I, I'm going to say over and over again, tell a story. Bring somebody along with you. Take them on like a journey. I know that sounds a little you know, fluffy and silly, but it really is effective because that's what people want to hear. They want to have stories. They want to envision themselves somewhere. Um, they want to see themselves, again, this is before stay, and then what could be possible? And your copy can do that. So any questions about this fourth framework? The last framework we're going to talk about is uh, we can spin it. And this one's pretty simple. It's pretty easy to understand and explain. And we can walk through this where you're going to explain the situation, you're going to introduce the problem, you're going to suggest an idea after you introduce that problem, and then you're going to tell somebody what's next. So this one I feel like is doesn't require much explanation. We can just jump right into the example. And that example is this right here. So as a working parent, you already have a few full-time jobs. You don't need another one. But managing your family's finances takes time, effort, and energy that you don't have. Instead of piling more tasks on your to-do list, get a professional financial advisor on your side. For only $149 per month, we'll work together to create a plan and accomplish your financial goals. Get started by booking a free 30-minute session today. So this first part, that's we're going to introduce the situation. And maybe this could be in an email or a blog post. It's kind of your introduction. It's like, hey, this is what's going on in your life. They know that, but you're providing some context for what you're about to roll into with the rest of these. You're setting up that problem, which is that as a, if here's the situation. As a working parent, you got a lot going on. You got kids everywhere you got to manage. You don't need another full-time job. And as you all know, financial planning is a full-time job. So their problem is that they don't have the time, effort, or energy to do that. So we're going to introduce an idea for them. Like, hey, did you know you can hire someone at a really affordable monthly rate? It's very easy, and this problem could be solved for you. That's an idea. But again, we don't want to leave them hanging, and that's where that next part is really, really important. And it's going to a lot of the times look like this. It's a call to action. It's telling them explicitly, here is what you do next. 
Uh, there's no more beating around the bush. It's not very subtle. It's very, very clear. Because again, working parent, don't have time and effort. Don't leave them guessing. Tell them what's next. Any questions about spinning things? Yes. I don't have a set ratio, um, and a lot of the times I just kind of go by feel, um, what sounds right. And I don't know if there is like a good, if that's, that's a, there's a rule of thumb out there. That's a really good question. I would like to know if there's something, if anybody has looked into like, if you break it down like this, it's more effective. So I don't know, I usually just kind of write and I'll go back and say like, does this make sense? Is this something I want to read? Does it feel kind of salesy? And if so, I might adjust, like pull back from laying it on thick with like, hey, you got problems, I can solve them, you know? Um, so that's how I kind of work through it is I'll just write it down and then I'll kind of go back and say, does this actually sound genuine and authentic? Um, which genuine and authentic is hard to measure. But um, I would be interested to know, I'll have to look that up. Thank you for the good question. Any other questions about this one? Awesome. So those are the five, oh, I'm sorry, yes? Yes. This one? I, I think so, I think I sent them in to FinCon people, so I think they're accessible. I'll, I'll share my email um, and everything later, so if you want to email me. I'm sorry, oh, they're in the app, oh, nice. I should know these things, thank you. <laughs> Are we all set on this slide? Good, awesome. So I wanna leave you, um, these are the frameworks and that's all great, but how do you actually start using them? So just a quick couple of tips that'll help make your writing, no matter what framework you use or what you're writing, um, even if it's not copy, even if it's not sales, maybe it's just um, an email to somebody else or internal communication within your firm. Um, it doesn't have to be formal or for a sales purpose all the time. You can use some of this stuff to make your writing stronger just in general. So the first one here, and this is the biggest one, please write like you speak. School teaches us how to write very, very obnoxiously. Um, and it's really hard to drop that habit. I actually majored in history. Don't ask me how I ended up in finance and marketing. Um, but it taught me how to write in a really <coughs> prosy, kind of fluffed up, very self-important way. And it took me a long time to drop that habit. And it's not compelling when you write like a history paper. I'm sure that's, that's not a hard argument to make. Um, so think about that when you're writing. Um, if you tend to be very formal and very stiff, take a step back and just write like you speak. It doesn't have to be hard, it doesn't have to be complicated. And one exercise that I really like to do for this is when I write something and I wanna go back and edit it, I'll sit and I'll read it out loud. And when I do, I can see like, oh, this, this, isn't, this isn't me, this doesn't sound like me, this isn't authentic. So I'll go back and I'll try it. I'll even speak out loud what I'm trying to say and then I'll write that down. So that may help you break the habit of writing very formally um, and speak a little bit more casually. We don't wanna throw all formality out the window, so definitely go back and edit for you know, good grammar and stuff like that, but this will help you sound much more compelling and persuasive because somebody knows at the other end of that communication is another human, and it's all about connecting with people. It's about having a conversation. That's really what we wanna do. On a similar note, speak to somebody direct, uh, directly this goes back to our original point about know your audience. This is really gonna help you if you know your audience and you can picture one person. I do mean just one person. I know that kind of sounds scary if it's like, you know, writing a blog post to one person. Well, what about all the other people that you hope are reading it? That's gonna come through. If you know your audience, you're gonna find people are very similar. They have similar mindsets as, you know, your, your target market. So it's gonna naturally attract in other people and the real ideal client that you wanna work with is gonna feel like you are, you are speaking right to them, you get them, you know what they're going through. So speak to somebody directly. And you also wanna to talk to humans first, SEO second. This is another bad habit that I had to break um, because I went through like my marketing education and I wanted to know like, okay, SEO, that's how you rank in Google, that's how you bring in traffic. If you're writing and nobody's reading it, well, what's the point? I need the traffic. So SEO is important, and I'm not discounting that at all, but prioritize people um, for a couple of reasons, because people are the ones who consume your content, first and foremost, but also because Google and search engines have gotten way smarter. They're, they're a little too smart. Uh, they now understand the intent of the searcher a lot better, 
uh, and they also understand the context around your copy. So they're much better at sending the right people to the right content. So you can write for people first, and Google will still understand you. You also want to engage somebody's curiosity. We are all very, very curious creatures. I am super nosy. So I like to know all of the things. So when you can engage somebody's curiosity in your copy, and that means asking like questions like why, or using open loops, and kind of slowly giving somebody information throughout a blog post instead of just giving away, like, hey, here's what this is right up front. You kind of want to tease that through your content. Um, again, you can do that with headlines that use like why or, or how and kind of get somebody to want to know the answer, ask questions and kind of pull somebody in. And then again, just like our problem solution framework, if you ask a question, if you put something out there that's like, oh, I want to know, deliver later. Make sure you don't leave somebody hanging. Give them the answer, give them what you've promised to deliver. You also, again, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, tell stories. People are really interested, and, and this is kind of playing off the curiosity thing. We want to know. We want to be, um, it, we don't want to be sold to. We want to be communicated with. We want to learn things. Um, that's why social media is so fascinating, is because it's a bunch of stories about other people, and that's really compelling to us. We want to know more. So whenever you can, don't just state like the facts. Put it in the context of a story that your, your reader can enjoy. And you also, this is a, a big, big hairy goal, but it's awesome when you can hit it. If you're either highly entertaining, highly educational, or highly inspirational, preferably all three. And that preferably all three, um, Chris Golobo is the one um, who had that quote. He's the one who founded World Domination Summit. He wrote The $100 Startup. Um, I think his blog is The Art of Nonconformity right now. Um, so he is a really, really good storyteller, and he produces a lot, a lot of content. That's how he's built his business, is on content. So he knows what he's talking about. So if you can be highly entertaining, educational, or inspirational, hopefully all three, but like pick two. Aim for two all the time. Um, that's going to make your writing much more persuasive, much more engaging, and leave somebody in a place of like, all right, I'm going to keep going with this. I'm enjoying this. I'm getting something out of it. Now, as far as some practical things, some tactical things, like we were talking about earlier, you can use headings and subheadings to draw attention to things. You can use bullets. You can use bolded text. You want to really organize stuff, especially when it's online, especially when it's coming from a place that somebody's going to read it on a screen. You want to make that super, super easy for them. That also includes breaking up your text using white space. Um, and this is because we all have very short attention spans now. And that's not necessarily a knock on us. We've kind of had to do it out of necessity. There is so much content out there now. And it's a great thing. You can find anything you want but you are never going to be able to consume all of it, which is kind of disappointing. But it's, it's the reality. There's so much content, we're never going to get to all of it. So we've got to be really selective in what we're reading and creating your content so it's very easy for someone to quickly skim through and say, yes or no, this is for me or it's not for me, is going to be more compelling to people. You're going to draw people, the right people in, and the, the wrong people are going to say, OK, this isn't for me. I'm going to leave now. So the idea is, instead of having like this big wall of text, that is going to make somebody bounce right off. They're not even going to look. Even if they are the right people, they won't get far enough into what you're saying to know that. They're just going to see that and be like, eh, nope, got not, don't have time for that. <laughs> so use organizational formatting. Make it really, really easy for your reader to quickly skim and then to capture their attention, again, with bolded text, with bullet points, and things like that. Also. Please avoid jargon or ver verbose language. Don't be all you know, writing beautiful prose. It's kind of hard to read. Um, and it's not something we want to spend our time with a lot of the times, especially when we're looking at evaluating something or making a purchasing decision. It's not really the right time or place. Um, if you'd like to write poetry, please feel free to do so. Probably not on your business website. So keep again, it's all about just remaining human. Talk to humans like you talk to humans face to face, right that way. Um, that's much more engaging and compelling. People are likely to stick around because it's easier to connect with you. And try not to drone on and on and on. Make your point. If you can say something in five words and you can say it in one word, choose the one word. Be concise. Um, again, because we don't have time. We're trying to make decisions very, very quickly, and we have a lot of decisions to make. So on that note, I will stop. I will hush. Um, I will give you guys the floor. Um, I just, if you would like to connect with me, I'm very easy to find. My name is spelled really weird. So if you can get the spelling right, I'm the only one out there. It's K-A-L-I-H-A-W-L-K. 
um, that's Gmail, that's my website, I'm on all the social media networks that way. Um, so pretty easy to find. So please feel free to connect with me after this. Um, and if you have any questions now, again, I'd love to turn the floor over. We can talk about questions, ideas, comments, feedback, anything y'all y'all want to discuss. Yes. What are some common mistakes that you see in other people's property that we would advise us not to do? Um, the most common one I feel like is writing like a robot. Um, it's very stiff and very formal, and it's kind of, it's just disconnected from how people actually communicate now. Um, and again, I know there's a fine line between you don't want to be super casual and come off unprofessional but you can be human. Um, it's, it's just very, it's very formal and it's, it's not approachable, it's not accessible. And it's also a lot of the time it's about the advisor. It's not really about who they're trying to talk to. So I feel like that kind of connects again back to the knowing your audience. If you know your audience and you can speak to them, it's always gonna be about them. And that loops back to being about you and how you can help them, but it's about them first. Yeah, right. Um, I, again, I would put it in the context of a story. Don't just list out, you know, here's, here's, here's the benefit, and this is what you're going to get. Put it in, like, perhaps tell a story about a client, you know, and you don't have to tell, talk about a specific client. You can totally make up the story. Um, but just talk about them and, and how they went through the process and what, res what was the outcome for them? What was life like afterwards? And you don't have to sell yourself at all. You don't have to talk about, like, here's, here's the service, here's what you get. Um, it's more subtle than that, if that makes sense. Right. Um, it's right. not directly it's talking. Sales, but it's about selling that concept, that idea, that this is how it will work out. You know, this is the solution for you. Right. Um, yeah, I guess the story you have to uh, sort of create that connection better. Yeah, the, what I like to do is, is not coming right out and saying it. It's kind of... It's almost being like kind of beating around the bush about it. It's not being so direct. It's kind of talking about all the things around this. And I never actually state like, here's what you can buy, you know, that sort of thing, because that feels salesy to me. Um, it's just talking about what actually happens for someone in real life. Like, what is their life like now? How has that changed for them? What does their day to day look like? Um, that's maybe how you can dig into some of that storytelling without talking specifically or directly about product and service. Record yourself, record yourself, and then go back and listen to it and, and transcribe yourself. Um, really, when we create content, we should spend 20% of our time creating and 80% of the time promoting it um, if you want to grow an audience. And a great way to do that is to repurpose content. So if you feel like you are great at speaking, then record yourself and maybe explore like video or podcast. Put that out there and then either you or an assistant or something like that, go back through and transcribe it. You may have to clean it up a little bit and edit it and put it you know, in the right format for like digital consumption, but that'll give you a really great start. And because I do the opposite. I don't speak well, I know that. <laughs> so I have to sit and like this presentation, I sat and I wrote it all out first and then I practiced speaking it. Um, for me, that's just how it works a lot better. That's how my brain works. So if you're the opposite, do the opposite. Speak it out first and then record yourself um, Dragon Diction, I think, is one that you can use. Um, Google Docs also has a voice-to-text functionality. Um, so do that, then go back and clean it up and, and just keep, they'll probably produce content faster that way, too. Yes? Sarah, can you just describe your review process after you've written a piece of content? Do you want to go back and make sure you edit it for grammar, do you want to make it more persuasive? What are some of the steps that you take after your initial writing? Um, first, I'll go back and, and just try to condense it. That's the first thing I do, is I'll write it all out, and then I'll go back, and how can I make this shorter? How can I make it more concise and snappier? 
Um, and then I'll usually put it in something like Hemingway. I don't know if you guys have heard of this app. It's HemingwayApp.com. It's totally free to use. You can take your copy um, and plug it into this editor and hit edit, and it will kind of help you further. It'll, it'll point out grammatical things, and it'll also point out things like active and passive voice. Um, it'll help you see where you can use a simpler word if you've used a very complex word. Um, and you can, and it'll show you the, the, uh, the reading level of your writing. Um, and the goal is to get it to a pretty low reading level. Um, it's much easier to consume, it's much easier to understand. Um, I'm sorry? Um, probably like seven to nine. It'll say like grade seven to nine. Um, that's a good place to aim for. Not, not that's not appropriate for all content, um, but it's kind of a good rule of thumb to use to make sure that you're writing simply and concisely. So I'll go through all that. Um, depending on what it is, I may read it out loud to myself. Um, but again, like I was saying earlier, I don't have like a really set review process or formula. I go a lot by feel. Um, and I think that just comes from doing it over and over again. And you'll find if you can kind of get that initial structure down where you're writing concisely and your grammar is all nice, then it's much easier to go back and say like, okay, is this something that someone would actually want to read? And you may be able to get somebody to help you. A lot of the times when I started, I would send stuff to my mom. I would send everything I wrote to my mom. And I'd be like, can you rip this apart, please? And she would, she would. And it was really helpful because it helped me learn like, okay, what do people who don't have any idea of what I'm doing over here, if it's something that you know, they can point out and say, like, this could be better, or, oh, I really like this, that's how I started learning how I was on the right track. So I think the real answer is just write a lot and do it again and again and again. What's the app? Uh, Hemingway app, like Ernest Hemingway. Yeah. HemingwayApp.com. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, thank you. Jeez. <laughs> thank you. That's a good question. Um, I think the problem and solution one is a good place to start um, when you have not used a lot of these because they're very simple, it's very straightforward. Um, when you start getting into more complex and more lengthy things, then I might switch over to like the spin framework. I really like that one because you, you kind of are able to walk through more like, here's the situation, oh, here's a problem, and hey, let me introduce this idea to you. It kind of gives you more runway um, so that's kind of how I use it. When I need something short and snappy, the problem and solution is simple, it's easy, it's fast, and it keeps me concise, it keeps me focused. When I have more room to tell a longer or more complex story, I'll get into maybe the features and benefits one or again the spin framework where I can really dive into it, I can go into detail, and I still have that framework to kind of keep me on track. Um, I would definitely always always do research, always test things. Um, what I like to do is try to A-B split test things. So what I'll do, and something like in MailChimp, for example, if I send out an email campaign, um, you can tweak the content. And you can have one email have a certain type of content, and another email go out to you know half of your list that's, that's a little bit different. So that's how I like to test things, is just send it out and kind of see, measure the results by click rate, by open rate, things like that. I haven't directly gone to somebody and be like, hey, which one do you like better? But that's, that's an interesting idea and could fall into the knowing your audience part of this, which is the initial legwork to do. Um, I would definitely say that the answer is yes, definitely test, iterate, experiment. Just be sure that you're tracking things so that you know what works and what doesn't. So yeah, I like the A-B split test, but that's an interesting thing to add to kind of your market research is like, if I gave you these, which is, you know, which makes you feel better, which gives you the warm fuzzies. You know. Yes. Uh, 
Um, I would usually say longer is better. Um, people tend to, especially when you're selling something, when you're trying to market something, people want information, especially if they're that, in that evaluation or evaluation stage. They want the information, they want the education. So I would definitely say longer is better. Um, there probably is a cutoff point where it's like this is too much, but again, that's where that organizational formatting is gonna come in. Use headings and subheadings to break things up, use bullet points. Um, so a specific word count, I always try to have things be at, like, at a minimum 800 words, but I really like to be in between 1,000 and 1,500. Um, does anybody ever read Michael Kitsis' blog in here? So that's like 4,000 words. That's a lot. And he has an insane audience. And Google has rewarded him by giving him great results in search engine rankings. So Google does tend to like longer form content. Um, especially as more and more content's being produced because longer form content is seen as more valuable, both by Google and by people. Um, if you have just short little snippets, we tend to discount it. Did you have a question? Um, let's see, what are we doing for time? Ooh, we are early. Great, it's lunch. Uh, <laughs> do you all have any other questions or anything that you just want to share or throw out there? Awesome, okay. Oh, yes. Last one. Yes. Um, as in a marketing context, um, Seth Godin, All Marketers Are Liars, and it's crossed off and it says tell stories. Um, I really like that book because um, that's it's all about storytelling, selling yourself via stories. Um, in terms of writing, On Writing by Stephen King is really interesting, um, and it kind of talks about in a really roundabout way. It doesn't directly say like, hey, here's how to write better, but again, he actually he's telling a story throughout it. It's really interesting to me. On Writing by Stephen King. Um, let's see, The War of Art is also one that I would highly recommend for anything creative-wise. Um, and then this falls under that, this is all about creating content. Um, as far as specifically on just improving writing, like very technical stuff, is that kind of what you're looking for as well? Um, probably like an AP style guide or um, an MLA. You just sit with that and read through it. It's going to be very painful. But um, it will kind of help you understand like, and build your knowledge of the rules. And then once you know those rules, you can break them. And you can know when to break them. And it it's makes your writing a little bit more effective. Yeah. I'm sorry? What did I say the first book was? Yes, all marketers um, are liars. And it's crossed off and tell stories. It's Seth Godin. So I would say for if you're into marketing, especially like inbound marketing, anything by Seth Godin is going to be a great resource. Also HubSpot. HubSpot is incredible with putting out content on their blogs. You can download so much free stuff from them as far as ebooks, templates, guides. I would highly, highly recommend going to, the, to HubSpot, their marketing blog, if you're interested in inbound marketing. They also have a sales blog, um, which I have not dug into so much. But if you're running your own firm, you need to market and you need to know how to sell. So I would definitely check that out as well. So cool, if that's it. Thank you guys again so very much. If you want to contact me later, that's it. Thank you.